Hey One Piece fans, what if I were to tell you that I had a pretty good idea as to what Laugh Tale probably looks like? That Laugh Tale, and by extension the ancient kingdom that it was likely a part of, looked a lot like ancient Greece or ancient Rome. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Bar, and today I want to start by taking us back to the Ennius Lobby arc where we have this conversation between Professor Clover and the Gorosei where he's talking about this great ancient kingdom. What he tells us is that there was an ancient kingdom, a great kingdom known the world over. They had a lot of power, they had you know, pretty advanced technology, they were able to produce the ancient weapons, uh, the poneglyphs, so on and so forth, and that they had a great enemy that this great enemy would later go on to defeat them in battle. And the end of the Void Century was marked by both the defeat of this ancient kingdom and the birth of the world government. But before Clover is able to give us a name for this ancient kingdom, he is shot and we never learn it. Ever since then, it's been pretty common, I would say, for people to associate this great kingdom with Laugh Tale. You know, whether or not they're the same place is, is a different discussion entirely, but they're definitely connected, and we can assume that when we get to Laugh Tale, we're going to be learning a lot about the history of this great kingdom. And thankfully for us, while Clover is giving this explanation, we do get a vague depiction as to what the ancient kingdom probably looked like. And taking a look at this depiction, you know, I can't help but notice there seems to be some sort of Greek or Roman influence on the architecture here. You know, it kind of looks like these buildings have uh, the, the classic, you know, Greco-Roman style marble pillars lining the buildings. And, you know, they do have this sort of like marbly white color in the depiction here. Uh, you can see on the other side of the island, there's like a sort of crater, but it almost in a way kind of looks like a coliseum or arena of some kind, which was a staple of, you know, Roman cities. You know, once again, it's a very vague depiction, but what I can say for certain is that the architecture here does not look to be Asian in appearance or Arabic in appearance or Northern European in appearance. It seems to have a very distinctive look to it, and the closest thing that I can compare that to is ancient Greco-Roman architecture. And I don't think Oda would shy away from doing something like this. You know, most of the major locations in the story, especially the ones that have a deep history connecting to the Void Century or something related to the Poneglyphs, a lot of them tend to be based off of real-world ancient civilizations and cultures. You have Alabasta, which is heavily based off of Egypt. You have Skypea, which is clearly inspired by the Mayans. You have Fishman Island, which has a mix of stuff like some Chinese and, and Greek and, and Japanese uh, influence going on there. You have Zo, which is apparently inspired by Yemen, and Wano is inspired by ancient Japan, clearly. Elbaf is inspired by the ancient Nordic cultures of the Vikings, you know, so on and so forth. Even with Amazon Lily and the Kuja pirates there, they, they actually have some influence coming from Greek culture specifically with the Gorgon sisters and the, the fact that they are literally called Amazon Lily, the Amazon warriors were a real thing in Greece. And what do all of these places have in common? Skypea, Zo, Fishman Island, Amazon Lily, Wano, Elbaf, What's the common denominator? They're all isolated, for one. All of these places are isolated in some way, whether it be in the sky or in the ocean or on a plateau or, you know, just closed off from the outside world in the calm belt. All these locations are heavily isolated. And they're also almost all locations that have heavy, heavy connections to the Void Century and the Great Kingdom of the Past. So we see that Oda has a tendency to make these like isolated, hidden civilizations that are correlated with the Void Century all based off of some sort of like ancient civilizations. But we haven't really seen anything based off of the ancient Romans. And I think that's pretty significant. The ancient Roman Empire was one of the largest empires on planet Earth in human history. It was so significant that it has influenced culture for thousands of years since its prime. They were known to be powerful, they were known to be widespread, unbeatable, very technologically and culturally advanced, and you know, Eventually, they were destroyed. They, they collapsed despite their reputation. And now they're just a relic of history. You know, there was a time where Rome was the greatest empire in the world. And now they're just associated with their fall. Um, the fall of Rome is definitely a heavy inspiration for the fall of the ancient kingdom as far as I'm concerned. 
Another interesting detail about ancient Rome is that it was the first place, at least in the West, that popularized the use of multiple names, or at least more than two names, you know? Prior to that, a lot of people would have only one name, or a first name and a family name, but in Rome it wouldn't have been uncommon to see someone with three names, or maybe even more, a, a primary example being Gaius Julius Caesar. The idea of having like multiple names, a first, middle, and last name is kind of a Roman thing. And then in one piece, you know, if we're gonna assume that the clan of D has some connection to the ancient kingdom, well, you know, they're the only characters in the story that have multiple names like that. They have a, a, a middle name, they have a middle initial that, that stands for something. So you have Monkey, D, Luffy, Trafalgar, D, Water, Law. You know, these, these D members that have these long names, that's something that is directly connected to, you know, the naming of Romans back in the day. Let's take a step back from that and look at the map of the One Piece world. We have the red line and the grand line going across the world in a belt and they intersect forming an X, right? Everyone knows this. When you enter Reverse Mountain and you go over Paradise, you go through the first half of the grand line and you arrive at the red line on the other end. What happens when you get to that X, that intersection? Well, on that X, you encounter two very important kingdoms that have heavy ties to the Void Century and the Great Kingdom of Old. On the top of the red line, the former location of the Kingdom of Gods, the Kingdom of Lunarians. Below the red line, you have the Kingdom of the Fishmen, the Ryugu Kingdom. Let's start with the Lunarians. We know that the Lunarians have to have a deep connection to the Void Century and the Ancient Kingdom because otherwise, why would the world government have hunted them to near extinction? And if we're trying to connect this to like the Greco-Roman symbolism in Laugh Tale or the Ancient Kingdom, well, look no further than the name Lunarians, right? Lunaria is a Latin word, a word meaning moon-like or of the moon, and Latin was the primary language of ancient Rome. King, the only Lunarian we know in the story right now, has a tattoo on the Side of his face that looks like an olive branch or a laurel wreath, which are incredibly important symbols in ancient Greek and Roman culture. That's literally like one of the first things I thought of when I first saw King was that that tattoo had a very visual similarity to like a laurel wreath, that sort of thing that uh, you know emperors in Rome would put on their head or you would see that on emblems, things like that. That's what that looks like to me. Fishman Island is primarily based off of a place called Ryugu Jo, a kingdom in a Japanese folktale uh, which is the host of a princess of the sea known as Orohime. Sound familiar? Orohime lures a fisherman into the kingdom and spends time with him and gives him a tamade bako box telling him when you go back to the surface never open it, never look inside. He goes back to the surface and finds out that Many years have passed since he's been down there, even though he was only down there for a short time. And when he opens the box, he finds that the box contains all the years that he spent down there. And he instantly gains back all of his age and shrivels up into an old man and dies. Once again, sound familiar. So this is what Fishman Island is based off of, this Japanese folktale. But interestingly enough, we see a mix of other influences in Fishman Island, particularly Greek and Roman influence. Once again, Fishman Island is a place ruled by a King Neptune, Neptune being the Roman god of the sea. Uh, his daughter, Shirahoshi, is actually the ancient weapon Poseidon. And while we're at it, Fishman Island is the first place we learn about all the, the names of the ancient weapons. And all the names of the ancient weapons have Greek and Roman names. They're named after Greek and Roman gods. This is also the location in the story that introduces Joy Boy as a character. You know, Joy Boy, the most important figure of the Void Century. He was introduced here. We can also see, looking at Fishman Island, that some of the buildings also have traces of Greek architecture. You can see the, the classic marble columns lining some of the palaces and some of the mansions. You can see that influence there. Pretty much all of Fishman Island is based off of the story of Atlantis, the lost city of Atlantis. It's a Greek story and it is a story of an island where the people on this island rebelled against the gods and the gods in retaliation sunk this island into the sea. You can see the connections being made here already, but if Fishman Island has that Greek influence and Fishman Island was a very very close ally presumably of this great ancient kingdom we can only assume that that influence must have come from somewhere 
You know, interestingly enough, Joy Boy did leave a letter behind for the original Poseidon. And if Poseidon was her actual name, then that would mean that the Queen of Fishman Island back then also had the name of a Greek god. So interesting connection there. Let's wrap everything up by talking a little bit about Joy Boy, okay? Joy Boy seems to have a very deep connection with Sun God Nika. We still don't know for sure if they're the, the same person. It's kind of like a Laugh Tale Ancient Kingdom situation. Joy Boy and Nika, we're still not entirely sure if they're one and the same, but we can assume they're heavily related. And there's actually a connection with Nika as well to, to Greek culture. I've seen a lot of people mention that his uh, name, N Nika, comes from the Greek goddess of victory, Nike. But personally, I don't really see the Nike connection. While it does kind of help my case because it is a Greek goddess, I do think there is a different god in Greek mythology that is a much heavier influence on the design of Joy Boy, of Nika, and Luffy in particular. And that Greek god is one of the most important ones in the entire pantheon, the god Apollo. Let me tell you a little bit about Apollo. Apollo was a very powerful, very, very loved god, and he was known as the god of the sun and sunlight, music, dance, and most importantly, truth and prophecy. These are all qualities that we could probably apply to Nika as well, and they would be 100% accurate to his character, at least from what we know of him now. Another interesting thing about Apollo is that he was known to be a very helpful god. He was known to offer help to others, and he was also known to ward off evil. A very, very interesting comparison to Luffy and Nika because they tend to do the same thing. Luffy is constantly getting dragged around because he wants to help others. So that seems like another close connection there. A really fun detail about Apollo is that he was the son of Zeus. And uh, I'll let the panel speak for themselves here. I mean, we even have the direct imagery of Luffy throwing lightning bolts at people. Uh, if Dragon is actually in possession of a devil fruit that lets him control the weather, and he's the reason the lightning struck at Logetown, I think the comparisons speak for themselves here. Uh, <laughs> you know, if we're gonna take it even further, Luffy is made of rubber, so he's completely resistant to lightning, you know? In this case, the sun god Nika or Apollo, the son of Zeus, would be resistant to lightning. That, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Also, Conqueror's Hockey is depicted as lightning, and Luffy has incredibly powerful Conqueror's Hockey. So, I think there is a clear connection being made here between the Greek god Apollo and the sun god Nika of the One Piece world. And, and if that's the case, and Nika was a major part of the Void century and this ancient great kingdom, then, you know, I can only assume that that kingdom had further Greek and Roman influences. We haven't really seen that get represented properly in the story yet, and Oda really does love his, his mythology, so I don't think he's just going to miss out on it completely. You know, based on this information, I'd imagine that the Ancient Kingdom and Laugh Tale probably look a lot like some of the most fantastical Greek or Roman cities that you could think of. The, the ancient cities with all these massive grand buildings and arenas and, and statues and, and marble pillars and flowing aqueducts and waterways and, and plentiful food, merchants out on the streets. I could imagine a very beautiful, lively kingdom that was later destroyed. And I can, I can see us getting to Laugh Tale and finding the ruins of this kingdom that look a lot like the ancient ruins of you know any of these cities you can probably picture it in your mind right now what I'm talking about so yeah basically I'm theorizing that that you know laugh tale the ancient kingdom everything with the void century and and joy boy all that stuff was heavily inspired at least in my opinion, by Greco-Roman culture, architecture, history, and mythology. I think that's what we're getting when we finally get to that island. That's my prediction, and I think uh, it would make a lot of sense based on everything that's been set up in the story so far. Pretty much everything that's connected to the ancient kingdom has, has a direct connection to all these other ancient you know, civilizations that we've met thus far in the story. So that's pretty much it for this video, but before we go today, uh, I will have to remind all you guys to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Uh, but more importantly, I have an announcement. In the month of July, I'm actually going to be taking a trip to Japan for five weeks, which does unfortunately mean my content will not be able to come out in the same pace that it has recently. I'm going to be away for that time. I'm not gonna have access to all the same equipment and, and my computer and all that stuff that I have here at home in America. So I am going to be releasing a different type of content and that's why I wanted to announce this because I think it's pretty cool and you guys will find it to be very interesting and hype worthy. Me and my wife managed to get tickets to Universal Studios Japan and in particular a section of the park, a one piece themed section of the park 
that we have to get tickets for, you have to get early reservations for. And in there is a one piece like live action performance and there are all these great products and there's a restaurant in the park that Sanji will come around and serve you food. You know, a cosplayer play, performing as Sanji will come serve you food and he'll be mean to the guys and nice to the women. And what I'm gonna do is, aside from the show, because they don't let you record, I'm gonna vlog as much as I can about the One Piece stuff. I'm gonna see if I can talk to any of my wife's friends in Japan who are also big One Piece fans and get Japanese perspectives from other native Japanese people right in Japan. I'm gonna try and show all the cool merchandise. I'm going to try and record my time in the restaurant. I wanna show you guys some of the cool stuff that Japan has to offer regarding One Piece. And I don't see many people covering this because to be frank, most of the Western One Piece audience does not live in Japan and don't have access to these things. So while I'm there, I think it'll be cool, you know, for me to just show you some of that stuff. So that's an upcoming video series. Look forward to that. And, you know, apologies to all my patrons and members and, and fans on YouTube that for those five weeks, I won't be able to do my typical content. But hopefully this will make up for it and will be enough to get you guys excited. So prepare for some more Japanese perspectives. Prepare for some nice, cool One Piece vlog content. And uh, yeah, I'll be seeing you guys, I guess, tomorrow. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you guys on stream and uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. See ya.